Okay, who here loves the trauma drama? If so, you are in light company because we are gonna meet my friend Kyle, who is an EMT turned uh, ER nurse, turned trauma king, and he's gonna tell you all about the process, why he chose to go back to school, how school was, finding a job, and all about his specialties. If we haven't met yet, I am Bree. I am a nurse and NP mentor, interview strategist, and content creator. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> So fun fact, Kyle and I went to school together. We did. We are Emory we alums. We did. All right, so tell me a little bit about your background, how you, what you did before you were a nurse practitioner. Growing up, I was a military brat, and when I was a little kid, I used to chase fire trucks uh, when we lived on base. So mm. some emergency call fire truck, I was literally running out the door uh, looking at fire trucks. So when I was a kid, my desire was to be a firefighter. Uh, started that at my local volunteer fire station in Florida. And then when I turned 18, um, I continued uh, volunteer firefighting, went to EMT school, and then I went to nursing school, uh, basically with the hyper focus of, I just want to be a flight nurse. Mm -hmm. And um, so went to nursing school. And then when I became a nurse, uh, I worked in the neuro step down unit for a couple months and then went to the ER afterwards. And then that's when I got exposed to right. APPs. And then I was like, I that's want that job. Yeah. And, uh, so was a nurse for about five years before I went back to school and uh, went to Emory with you um, and then got a job working for trauma and acute care service. I think it's interesting because like your path is like such as like laser focused straight, like yeah. I'm doing this, you know, on the streets and now I'm doing this in the hospital and now I'm doing it as a provider. Like it seemed like you knew from the get go, this is exactly where you wanted to I was at like five and had like a calling of like, oh, I want to be a nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my calling was like, I want to be a firefighter. Uh, and I did that. And, um, and then when I was a nurse, um, you know, I worked in a pediatric and adult trauma center. So I used to do a couple of days in the pediatric ER and then a couple of days in adult. And so I felt like that kind of gave me a little bit more like well-roundedness. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was one of those things as far as exposure, um, and that kind of opened up the doors of, Hey, and they're doing a lot of things as far as autonomy and um, kind of going back to that pre-hospital fire department where you have a lot of autonomy, mm -hmm. uh, a small team making a large impact, uh, yeah. working well together. And that's kind of what I wanted. Yeah. I find that I have a lot of ER friends. I was ER for a lot of years yeah. too. And I find that a lot of ER nurses, um, the natural next progression is go to go to ICU. Mm -hmm. um, and what I think many people don't realize is you – Actually, in the ER, you don't have a lot of autonomy. You are very task-oriented. It is Correct. very, draw the blood, get the discharge done, give the meds. And when you're doing it, while well, you do get those fun things, the traumas and the stroke mm -hmm. alerts and all of these kind of things, they're kind of rare. The majority of the time, you're spending tasks, doing tasks. And mm -hmm. so you're not doing as much critical thinking as you are in other units. And so a lot of people come to me and they say, should I go to ICU? I'm like, well, if you want to do acute care, absolutely, because you're going to think totally differently when you work in the ICU. It's just, it's just different. Uh, I mean, I think uh, as far as the I ER, yeah, I think it's just different mindset. Like I was the guy who was listening to like MCRIT and all these critical mm -hmm. care podcasts, true, true. wanting more and more and more knowledge. Where I agree, it's very, um, you know, ER is task oriented. You, you kind of know those protocols, the chest pain protocol, you're going to do right. EKG labs, you know, abdominal pains, you know, labs, urine, uh, yeah. you know, probably imaging. So. Uh, but yeah, I think as far as everybody's a little bit individualized as how hungry I knew I wanted more. Yeah. So um, you never even considered FNP. You knew from the get, yeah. you wanted to do acute care. Yeah. So, you wanted to my, yeah, so I knew I wanted trauma. I was, like you said, a hundred percent specific. Yeah. My exposure yeah. was trauma. I saw, uh, when we worked in Florida, it was kind of start to finish as far as continuity. Uh, I went into that continuity with those patients, seeing them at resuscitation point. And then see them at discharge, mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's the group I wanted. Um, I kind of felt like it was the ER, the ICU, what was yeah, kind of new, yeah. yeah. And uh, I was really kind of determined that's what I wanted to yeah. do. How did you choose the school that you went to? Uh, I did apply to UAB. Uh, I didn't get in, uh, but I knew I was probably going to struggle a little bit just because it was the online. I'm not a very good yeah, uh, scheduler. Same. I'm not organized. I knew Emory uh, was down uh, the road from us. I knew it was a full-time program. And um, I think it was one of those things that I felt like I could probably do best um, in an in-person 
mm -hmm. uh, environment full time. I'm like you, like I needed in person. And we were in school five days a week, eight hours a day. Correct. <laughs> it was like yeah. super fast, but you got it done in 18 months. Literally, it was 70 miles down, seven miles up. And so it was roughly about two hours, two and a half. I used to wake up at 4.30, 4.45 yeah, in the morning. That's terrible. So I would work Monday through Friday, uh, or go to school Monday through Friday. And then I worked Friday and Saturday night shift. Uh, and then I would use my Sunday to flip. And so fortunately I was, you know, my wife worked and, uh, you know, kind of helped me, you know, support us while we yeah. were in clinical hours. But yeah, it was, it was definitely tough. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, joking probably before we went live, you know, wasn't probably the strongest as far as academics. And uh, that's just kind of how my brain triages. Um, yeah, but he's being modest because, okay, here's <laughs> the thing. Here's the thing. He was my lab partner. Poor dude got stuck. <laughs> And I swear to God, when we, uh, I could not figure out how to suture to save my soul. And I'm pretty sure I drove this guy nuts because I was like, I can't make this. How do I make this thing go into that thing? Like the instrumentation of it was so stressful. Yeah. And he's like, man, I just like do it. Just do it. I can't just do it. Yeah. I can think through it, but I can't do it. So we're, we were that's getting yang. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing too, because I was so hyper-focused on what I wanted to do as a career. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew like, you know, when we were doing like, you know, kind of like antifungal creams, you know, yeah. like, that has nothing to do with what my specialty has. And that's the same thing with going, like I was saying about nursing school, you know, I knew I was going to want to, I knew I wanted to work in the ER and uh, I really thought it was going to be like blood guts, blood guts, you know, I was going to be that, you know, that person who's always going to be in the trauma and, you know, that's, trauma is a, a small frag, small. fraction of what emergency medicine is and and, you know, I wish, you know, at, you know, those early years, I really would have focused on like the abdominal pain workup and the pathophys, yeah, yeah. the cardio uh, um, pathophys. And so that's, that would be my suggestion for, you know, the people who are thinking about going to nursing school or uh, maybe you're already in nursing school. Uh, you know, even though that you think that you want to do this specialty, uh, it's a small fraction, mm -hmm. uh, even at the busiest uh, centers and, you know, even the centers that are you still have to know the true path of fizz because, you know, blunt trauma affects, um, you know, multiple organ systems and just kind of knowing those organ systems will, will help you down the line. True, so. true. Yeah. And talking a little bit about what you do, I mean, that's kind of what we're getting into here is, you know, your service does acute care surgery as Correct. well. So you do a lot of non-trauma related Correct. things, a lot of gallbladders, a lot Correct. of bowels, yep. <laughs> a lot in this region of the body. <laughs> Yeah, and kind of coming on when I onboarded, you know, I was very comfortable with trauma, trauma mechanism, right. you know, pathophys, coagulopathies, and kind of the latest and greatest. And the uh, acute care surgery or the emergency journal surgery section that we do is, uh, as Bree mentioned, are the acute um, cholecystitis or uh, inflammation in the gallbladder, appendicitis, inflammation in the appendix, ruptured bowels, bowel obstructions. And I would say that's probably about 50% of what lot, we do. Yeah. Uh, onboarding was a huge learning curve. Mm. Um, you did know. you feel supported through that? Yeah, 100%. You did? 100%. You know, I did a clinical rotation. Uh, and when we went to lunch, you know, as a student, and even onboarding, like, that was time to discuss, like, workups. Right. You know, okay, what? tell me about diverticulitis. And, you know, why Why do we do IR drain versus a laparoscopic washout, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or diverting colostomy? Uh, what's the trigger to actually do surgery, not do surgery? And so that was kind of really the those intimate yeah. moments that onboarding is, you know, a long, probably four to five months mm -hmm. onboarding. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Now our surgeons are in house too, and they're a resource as well. But yeah. you know they may be in the operating room, and again right. we're a very autonomous group, and so it's just kind of hey. Yeah, you just you take know, care of business. Yeah, take care of business. So what is your schedule like? Uh, we work three twelves um, mm -hmm. a week, and uh, we don't have like set dates like on yeah. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and sometimes yeah. Thursday, Friday. It's kind of rotating in our. In our well, like you were, we were as nurses. Yeah, and yeah. our weekends rotate. Uh, mm -hmm. I. I, that works for me. Uh, I know some services do like a seven on, seven off. Yeah. There's no way that would. That's rough. There, <laughs> That's I, rough. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and I've been honest with everybody. You know, there's no way that could work with yeah. having two small it's kids. It's very hard. It's I love seeing hard. you as a dad. You know, when we met, <laughs> you was just beginning to envision what it could be like to have kids, and I was like in my late thirties in school with yes. middle school kids. Yeah. Like, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do it. It's too late. Okay. Yeah. 
I mean, parenthood's great, uh, and it's just trying to find that balance, especially when you have like two working professionals. Yes, and, that's it. And, that is uh, exactly it. And it's kind of, it, you know, it does sometimes tug uh, on, you know, kind oh, of marriage in uh, the kids, but, you know, we kind of support and kind of, you know, make do of it. Make do of it. And I think, you know, that's the majority of people. You know, I think the reality is, you know, Jesse, my wife, like knows my passion. Yeah, you gotta have that when you get back to school. If you yeah. don't have spousal support, it's gonna be rough. Yeah, and that, you know, that's what we see when we have students when they're doing that last semester and there's like 300 plus clinical hours and it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard for people to kind of juggle full time and clinical yes, hours. Yes. And, um, you know, we were all there. We all did it. I wanna go back to job acquisition just a little bit yep. because I think you have an interesting story with that. So tell me how you came about your job. All right, so uh, at the time, um, we had a new medical director. Uh, I worked at the hospital uh, where I, I work currently, and uh, basically, I just told him I wanted a job. Uh, <laughs> well, like, so, okay, so <laughs> let me let me paraphrase for him, okay? <laughs> He's such a dude, he just makes like, I just told him I wanted a job. Okay, there's a little bit more drama yeah, to yeah, it than that. It, and uh, they did not have an opening. They did not. Right. Uh, they did not. Now, uh, they were always said uh, they uh, needed more APPs, uh, but they were kind of waiting for a stable medical director mm -hmm. uh, because they were like doing intern medical directors and kind of figured out, you know, once we got a true medical director vision and kind of growing the service. But the key is he showed up. So he showed up for clinicals. He did a lot of hours with yeah. them. He excelled in it. He showed his passion with it and they liked him. So they created a place for him. Mm -hmm. And this is my point, y'all. You when you're trying to find a job just because there's nothing listed doesn't mean there isn't potential for the future yeah so show up to every single clinical on your a-game because you never know when it, they're going to recruit a, you yeah it is a working interview and Absolutely. you know there's definitely there's always like physician strategy mm -hmm. and a lot of people know and i think that would probably be like a good lecture for people to um hear in school or even on your youtube channel kind of that physician strategy you know, especially if you're in a health system, they're always trying to grow. Um, there's always volume and they're always looking at FTEs yeah. uh, and uh, just kind of making a case uh, that, hey, you know, we have somebody, we know somebody. Uh, he's going to be new, but he knows mm -hmm. he's teachable. Um, and uh, they kind of went to administration and got those positions approved. And, yeah. you know, those weren't posted and you never right. really know what's kind of the, the back uh, dialogue, what yeah. practices are having right. between leadership and physician strategy and um, or provider strategy uh, and growth plans mm -hmm. and uh, it's just kind of pick their brains and yeah I think a lot of people I think you kind of had the same thing Dr. Bailey right? oh yeah like, absolutely it, it I mean I tell everybody like I had five job offers they all okay all of them except the one I'm doing came from clinicals and one of them was actually at the melanoma clinic at Winship mm -hmm. I remember that and there was like Winship is such a big organization that every cancer has its own hallway. And so they're super segmented. And when I did a rotation with melanoma, they really liked me. And the late, I didn't know any of this, but the lady who worked there was getting ready to retire within the next year or two. And so because I performed well and they really liked me, they were like, hey, we would like you to come on. We'll create an FTE until she leaves and you'll get your own clinic. So again, I, I didn't go into like, I don't love melanoma. I mean, I like oncology in general, yeah. but like, I'm not like, oh, I love skin cancer. You know, like <laughs> it wasn't my thing, but I showed up with my A game, like prepared. I researched, I studied, I was ready to at least give some information and show that I was intrigued by what they do. And they see those things. That's one thing what we always, when we ask people, when we interview, it's great that you're here, but what can you do for the program? We're very program focused mm -hmm. uh, just because um, trauma, you know, reaches kind of everybody's the leading cause of death uh, up to the age of 46. And uh, we have a lot of outreach and uh, injury prevention things that we do. And uh, we really wanted somebody who can really just not clock in and clock out and mm -hmm. kind of you know, maybe do those extracurricular activities right. and education things right. uh, to kind of really um, show our brand and yeah. kind of what we do. Yeah, but um, I, I do, I think it's interesting you bring that up about people don't know what you do. So for people who are looking at going into trauma as an APP, like your role, you do everything from admission, like resuscitating them in the ER yeah. to admitting and, them. And so there's different things. And, um, and this, so this conversation is actually being held on the state level as far as the uh, Georgia Trauma Commission. So uh, we just had a retreat uh, about two weeks ago, uh, the Georgia Trauma Commission, and uh, APPs have never really been represented uh, on the 
kind of state level as far as like the Georgia Trauma Commission, you know, you have your trauma medical director cohort, uh, your program manager cohort, your lead registrars, uh, but APPs really haven't uh, been kind of recognized. And that's just because there's some trauma centers that don't have an AP, APP service. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not, um, uh, it's not fluid across the state on what all the APPs do. <laughs> and it's kind of organization specific, you know, uh, some APPs may just scribe uh, and kind of around where our program uh, was built on full autonomy. So from start to finish, uh, we're involved. And mm -hmm. so if you came in as a trauma, uh, we're usually on the left side uh, of the patient. Uh, the resident is on the right side. Uh, and if there's any A lines, uh, central lines, chest tubes, uh, start, you know, thoracotomy, uh, you know, prep and stuff mm -hmm. like that to assist the surgeon. Um, you know, we're involved with that. Mm -hmm. And then once the patient gets to the ICU, uh, we uh, participate in their ICU care and then step down the floor. Now we uh, do not participate in uh, the operative management of the trauma patients or the general, or emergency general surgery. And that was kind of a um, group decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason why is that we felt as an APP service, it wasn't physician driven, it was APP driven that we were better utilized as far as throughput mm -hmm. and at the bedside versus being stuck in the operating room for maybe four or five hours yeah. uh, when there could have been discharges or uh, enhancement of patient care. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're very patient centric mm -hmm. and that was kind of a decision made. Now there's other organizations that their APPs, you know, scrub in and yeah. you know, that's fine. I mean, that's, you know, that's whatever, you know, Just different models. Yeah, different models. Yeah. And so it's not consistent, but, those are things what I would ask. Okay, what what are what are my responsibilities going to be? Uh, what does a day look like? Mm -hmm. um, am I going to be able to participate? And it's not so much like procedure. You're going to get procedures regardless um, as far as where you work. Uh, but you want to know like, hey, am I going to be really fully utilized? You went to right. school. I mean, I have a you know I, over a hundred thousand dollars worth of student debt. Yeah, I'm like not to be able to use it. <laughs> I'm not going to be a glorified scribe. Yeah, and. Uh, and sometimes that may sound harsh, but that's the reality, you know. Yeah. Um, this goes, this touches on like a soapbox of mine that I'm sure all of these people are tired of hearing me talk about. But that there are, if you look at state board of nursing guidelines for mm -hmm. what our scope is, it is incredibly great. It is yeah. 20 pages long, and it makes no sense. And me doing this as a, and really investigating this stuff cannot understand it. So physicians can't understand it. And I've looked at multiple states. So I've looked at various different states for people who call me for advice they're all gray mm -hmm. none of them are very clear so it tends to be physician led and that tends to be um, culture specific mm -hmm. state specific um, as to what you can or cannot do even within this own state i've worked at multiple hospitals and i've worked in different roles in these different hospitals some places i have a ton of autonomy where we work now we are very blessed to work at a place where um, both of our programs have been developed with apps in mind as colleagues mm -hmm. as partners who work in tandem with physicians but are highly autonomous and once you've been doing that kind of work it's very hard to go back to just being a scribe or just putting in orders but there are many places who have that model um i remember when we were students <laughs> i can remember our teacher telling us you're going to want to work somewhere you have full autonomy we're like no we're not we're scared to death we want to go work somewhere somebody holds your hand but and that's true because at first you're scared uh, each specialty is a little bit different uh where you know for example cardiology you know you're not uh, doing active resuscitations as far as like chest tubes, central lines, because that's mm -hmm. just not the nature of cardiology. It's trauma and cardiology are completely different. Right. Uh, now, you know, our, our peers that work in the cardiology ICU, you know, they work for cardiology, uh, but they're ICU specific. And so they're doing right. swans and stuff like that. So it's kind of where that specialty where you land, it's going to be kind of what it's you can do. It's and, um, and yeah. so you know, and these are people who all work for the same organization and there's just kind of different models of yep. what your specialty is and what you have to deal with, you right. know? That says a lot, uh, I think, for our organization and the support of the APPs yeah. that we have when you look 10 years ago. Uh, and so I think some of those early champions uh, that were there uh, who came from academic centers and uh, used APPs and uh, saw the benefit and autonomy mm -hmm. of truly the physician extender. Okay, another hot topic I always ask people, do you feel like the market is saturated? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I think it's, so I would say it's saturated with 
people going back who I feel should probably still be at bedside. Yep. Uh, I really do think, um, I think we all know that there's a provider shortage. Uh, and as years go down the road, especially with this COVID insult, there's going to be a need for advanced practice providers. But I do feel that uh, there's unfortunately a um, not a good guardrail for people going back to school. And, you know, I had five years of experience and I really thought, you know, I felt like I was prepared for the next level. Uh, and the reason why I say that, as you remember, you know, we had a majority of our big 3P uh, lectures with all the cohorts. Yeah. And uh, some of our uh, our cohorts were basically um, BSN to MSN um, with no bedside experience. And yeah. so some of the questions they would ask, you're like, that's not reality. You know, yeah. uh, you're you're experience is based off your clinical limited clinical and so i really think there should be a kind of a mandate especially in the acute care For uh, sure. a couple years that really does a favor to the learner and then that's the ripple effect what gets to bedside right and it's just kind of that on the job experience you kind of kind of need you can't replace it and yeah no. i think somebody asked me this once they said well tell me how each of your jobs actually relate to what you do because like for example one of the jobs i did was home health care well how does that help you in the icu well a lot of ways because yeah i know yeah. when i admit someone who's a heart failure exacerbation yeah. what the problems were with them going home what the barriers were that i need to ask about did you actually fill your medicine did you have someone weighing you like so every single experience you have as a nurse will add to your experience as a nurse practitioner. And that's why we were able to basically skip medical school. We are learning medicine, y'all. We are learning medicine without the rigor of medical school. So you're condensing it down a lot and adding on to a strong foundation. So without that foundation, you're just condensing it down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Even though I know you may feel like you're ready, I really I would suggest taking maybe a couple years before I think so too. going back. I and, think so too. And that's just not being like salty, like, you know, that's, just, I think that's just, what advice would you give to someone who is living in a region where okay. we are, where the competition is, I don't like the word saturation. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess my thing is like, you can go, you can go back to school and find a job. There will be a job for you. But I guess the question is, are you going to be happy with that job? At, now saturated, I think there's saturated just from anecdotally hearing people here going back to school and I'm like, man, like, you haven't even been a bedside nurse. Like yeah. you should just give it a while. I yeah. think that's how yeah. I think I would answer kind of the yeah. question. Yeah. I think that sort of mirrors my own thoughts and that is that there are jobs out there, yeah. but it's going to involve you sacrificing something. Correct. It's not going to be your dream job in your dream location yeah. with your dream support staff. It's you're going to have to sacrifice. Uh, I remember Jennifer Adamski or Dr. Adamski said like your first job is not going to be your like your last, last job, job. and mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of true. Um, you know, I think you know life happens, life gets busy. You know, other opportunities, and so yeah, working here uh, get the fundamentals down, and you know once and something move on. Move mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But yeah. You may discover that, hey, I had no clue, like the melanoma clinic, like. Yeah, you may find yourself surprised. I mean, I really did not think I would like clinic at all, but yeah. I enjoyed clinic a lot more than I thought yeah. I would. I would have been happy working in clinic. So. so you tell me what you love about your job. What do you dislike about trauma surgery? I mean, I think lately now people have just gotten a little crazy. <laughs> Patients? Families. Oh, families are crazy, yes. I mean, I've, I've gotten yeah. more... Um, like in your face oh. uh, from family members, not like, you know, yeah. but like really just like, yeah. And just kind of like, but a lot of it's just like ends with apology and they're like, I just need an event. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's like, we're seeing more like the stressors of like the, the last pandemic, pandemic mm -hmm. uh, kind of at the bedside. 
yeah. like, they used to not be like I this. I think that's very situational. I've not, I mean, clearly, particularly in the COVID ICU, we deal with nothing but confrontation yeah. all day long, every day, all hour of the day. I mean, the distrust factor has changed. Our, I think our interaction with the public, I think forever. Yeah. Um, it's just part of how it's going to be. We're going to have to defend our actions a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I worked in trauma as a nurse for two years and I did find it like, it is very, it is the trauma drama factor is real. Like yeah, pe emotions are high. People have made poor life choices. Like it's, yeah. it's an interesting community it is. to it, serve. And you know, I always, you know, I kind of always had that like wall, uh, what says like, you know, I didn't, I didn't do this to them or right. I didn't make this choice. Uh, you know, um, and that's just speaking to like, you know, a subset of populations and trauma is not right. preventable. And, and, uh, you know, sometimes I just have that beer to kind of help cope, you know, with some of the, like the horrible things we do see. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes that's, you know, that's not like the best, but again, like we, this job's not a pretty job. Right. You, know? you got to kind of have a thick skin. Yeah. I think the negative thing is that bandwidth I, I mean right now that's what yeah. currently what i'm struggling with is bandwidth like there's a lot of moving parts and um i'm not the best organized person and so um i think that's just one thing what kind of probably takes somewhat of a toll on you it's just, yeah you trying feel, to be all things you, to all yeah and it's not it's not that things can't be delegated it's just those are those interests that i have yeah and, well that's because you are unique in that you very much um have a passion towards leadership and quality improvement yeah. and those kind of things um, so this, these are things that he does kind of on top of yeah. his role. As a, okay, so last question. Yeah. This is the one that all everybody always asks is, okay. and it's a little bit different right now, but did you make more as a new grad in P than you did as a bedside nurse? No, I make more I make more money now. Than you did as yeah, a bedside I'm sorry. nurse. Yeah, I'm I was sorry. like, yeah, you have to really evaluate yeah. your return on investment. Yeah. And now more than ever, it's become more tight. You know, I mean, when I went back, I tripled my salary, but I went from working part-time to full-time in this role yeah. so that was a big factor in yeah that. and i would say like the at the time uh the market uh adjustments for the bedside nurses weren't there the, right within the last five years right. our organization has done a lot yeah. uh to kind of increase bedside pay uh mm. for sure uh but yeah I think right now people who are looking at going back to school you know specifically for their acute care it it has to be for more than just you want to make money because yeah, even absolutely. without the crisis pay, just tra straight travel pay, you're making about what I'm making. So yeah, I, yeah, absolutely. It I mean, has to be like you desire a different relationship with patients. You desire yeah. a different treatment model. You desire a different role. It, it can't be because I'm tired of the bedside and I want to make more money. Yes. Yeah. Neither of those two things are going to be solved by going back to school. Yeah. And I think that's the thing. Like, and I, I was, that was really, pay was never really kind of intentions to right. go back. You just wanted to do it. It was more like autonomy. Pay was a perk for sure, but it was mm -hmm. never like, yeah, I just did this for the pay, yeah. you know? Because yeah. it's a lot of that's a, it's a lot of work, a lot of stressors it's, for. I it mean, it's a lot more. I mean, you think yeah. okay, so the physical part maybe is not as demanding, but the mental fatigue, y'all, decision fatigue is legit yeah. real. Yeah, I, I I joke around all the time because I I get annoyed where you know like Tylenol, right? Like. Tylenol is over the counter. I tell everybody, Tylenol is over the counter, and like we give it, I take it without even thinking, you know. And then you're in the role, and you're like, "This." That was the first order I made was for Tylenol. Somebody like, said, hey, "What are all the possible?" Yeah, it's Tylenol. I'm like, okay, like LFTs, like this, 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 you know. And I'm like, yes, you can get, yes, you can give Tylenol to like liver patients just at a reduced dose, but right. like something where I would have been like. As a regular bedside nurse, you wouldn't like, even thought twice about I thought it. Thought twice, and then you're thinking like, okay, downstream effects. Like, okay, I need to have the thirty thousand foot view of what's yeah. going on with the patient before I do it. And uh, so I would say there's a lot of that yeah. kind of second guessing. You're like, you know, I'm. You're like, man, I don't want to make a mistake. Yep, the burden is yeah is very there. Real. And, and again, like as I mentioned many times, we're greatly supported by our physician colleagues and. You know they're they're there and you know we used to have one say like you know I'll, I'll always I can always fix what you do you know like type thing and that, you know that kind of gives you like a little bit you know as a new ABP like a little bit confidence yeah. say okay like I'm not you know it's not like I'm ordering like potassium you know yeah. it's just hollow it's just hollow you know? <laughs> but I so. I was the same that was the first order I ever placed and man it took a while to hit that hit button. Submit. I was like hit submit it. And, it, and it still happens too like same thing with procedures like. We do a lot of procedures and, um, 
you know, even today, it's kind of like um, the risk is great. The, yeah, right and a systematic, uh, you know, process of okay, like I did yeah. a chest tube the other day on the floor, and you know, I had the CT up, and I'm like, okay, right side. I'm like everybody says right side, and like it's right, you know, and it's just yeah. not. It's not that I'm not confident. It's just that there's a lot of risks. There's infection risks, mm -hmm. uh, procedures. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing for a nurse to tell me, oh, I need a line. Like, but do you? Yeah. Let's think through. I mean, this is not without risk what yeah. I'm about to do to this person. I mean, there's so. potential for, uh, as, you know, people may know, like pneumothoraxes, vascular injuries, pseudoaneurysms. And, um, you know, is it really truly best for the patient? And, you know, sometimes you do have those conversations of like, it's not really bad, you know, yeah. and it, you know, it's, and you, but I would challenge people and tell them why, you know, yeah. what, what yeah. your thought process is. And, um, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's still days, you know, you're kind of, I don't ever go in the room and be like, man, I got this, you know, yeah. because everybody's unique. Well, thanks so much, Kyle. You've yeah. given us so much wisdom uh, for all the trauma drama junkies out there. Yeah. And I think, I think one thing too, um, I would say, and we didn't really touch about too much of it, but there's a lot of extra things that, as far as the job uh, that we can do to kind of better uh, healthcare. And um, like I said, we're very involved in the pre-hospital uh, setting, uh, where their pre-hospital blood project was kind of first in Georgia, one of the first in, in the Southeast and even the United States. And now we're doing pre-hospital ultrasound uh, so there's a lot of things as far as the AP uh, that it's just not hospital. You can actually do things. Mm -hmm. And even if you're in a specialty and you're kind of interested in wanting to help, I mean, we have people who work in different specialties who help with like stop the bleed stuff uh, yeah. and tourniquet education. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things that if you want to, it's there. Sure. The potential to expand yeah. the footprint and what yeah. we do is and the impact. Uh, and you definitely are very involved yeah. in that. I do admire that a lot about you. All right. <laughs> Peace out, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey. <laughs> Start over again. You're not in my head, right? You don't know where I'm taking this thing. I don't. That's scary. <laughs> it's a scary place to be. Yeah, there's only, only so much. Barkley review and uh, news talk and podcasts that you, you can, can listen, listen to in the car. Yeah, for two hours. Um, I listened to Charles Barkley for so long. What did I think for some Charles? No, Charles Barkley's a basketball player. <laughs> correct, correct. I, Mr. Barkley. Yeah, sure, Mr. No. And I'll be honest with you, I still don't remember any of that. So, <laughs> so yeah, not not that big of a deal. <laughs>